Hi there, um, you're all very welcome to our last event of the Digital Cultures webinar series. Um, so today we'd like to welcome Dr. Mercedes Bonds and Eva Yeager from the AI Creative Lab in Serpentine Gallery and um, uh, Zach uh, Ioannidis, who's, and I'm sorry, I've actually pronounced that completely wrong. You just actually gave it to me. Ioannidis, Zach Ioannidis. Um, and uh, from Forensic Architecture. And um, so the, this, which is our last event, is co-hosted by Elaine Hoey and myself. Um, we're bringing these different people, the pioneering work of Forensic Architecture and the work of the uh, Creative Lab together to discuss models of practice in relation to emerging technologies and creative processes. So we're gonna be thinking a little bit about the role of research as a critical tool but particularly maybe exploring how artists and designers are engaging in practice-based research at the intersection of these spaces in academia, in art and activism. Um, I'm gonna hand over to uh, Elaine now, who's going to introduce our speakers. Hi everyone. So I'd like to um, say introduce our two speakers, uh, Dr. Mercedes Buns and Evie Yager, uh, who will be uh, kind of co-hosting the first presentation. Uh, on their work uh, around the Creative AI Lab at the Serpentine Gallery in London. So before I hand it over to, to you guys, um, I'll just do a brief bio for each of you. Dr. Mercedes Buns is the Serpentine Gallery's Creative AI Lab Principal Investigator and Senior Lecturer in Digital Society at the Department of Digital Humanities, King's College London. Her research explores how digital technology transforms knowledge and power. She has previously worked as a journalist, including tech, as technology co correspondent for the art. Uh, the she studied philosophy, art history, and media studies at FU Berlin and the Bauhaus University at Weimar, getting her doctorate with a thesis on the history of the internet, in which she gave free reign to her curiosity about digital technology. I really like that sentence. Her last pu publication is The Internet of Things from Mikkel and the Calculation of Meaning on the Misunderstanding of New Artificial Intelligence as Culture, published in the journal Culture Theory and Critique. Uh, uh, you're very welcome. And Eva Jager is an artist and associate cur curator at the Serpentine Galleries in London, and is also co-investigator of the Creative AI Lab, a collaboration between King's College London and the Serpentine Gallery. Ava is currently working on the Future Art on Future Art Ecosystems, Volume Two, an annual strategy, strategy briefing launched in 2020 that involves concepts, references, language, language, and arguments that can be integrated into operational agendas for the construction of 21st century cultural infrastructure. A forthcoming paper with Dr. Mercedes Bones, inquiring the back ends of machine learning, artworks making meaning by calculation, which will be presented at Art, Art Machines 2, forthcoming performance work with Studio Legrand Jaeger, and a, a collaboration with Guillemette Legrand at Victoria and Albert Museum, London. You're both very welcome tonight. So I'll hand it over to you and we'll do our questions and answer sessions once the whole um, all the speakers have spoken. Thank you. So Thank you so much. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we're going to start right away after our long introduction with two long biographies um, <laughs> um, and go right in uh, what we're doing at the moment. Um, it will be quite dense, but we try to make it as lively as possible. So um, we present a bit um, research we do at the Creative AI Lab, inquiring the back ends of machine learning artworks and we'll explain what we mean. Um, our presentation shares research conducted at the Creative AI Lab, which is a collaboration between Serpentine's R&D platform and our department, Digital Humanities at King's College London. The aim of the AI Lab is uh, to surface particular ways in which artists make use of machine learning. We've been interested in quite a long time and study this now for two years. And uh, we would like to create models for engagement with the new technology of AI. And we think art is a very good way to go about. Our research is situated in contemporary art and creative media studies and science and technology studies. So the creative, creative AI lab is a bit practice, but also quite research driven as you will see. So our very first project two years ago was to build a database of creative machine learning tools, courses, and research on ML AI technologies. And you can check it out at creativeai.org. 
Um, we've also experimented with turning our research into all kinds of public activity, including commissioning artists and writers and researchers to contribute to the database, panel discussions, lots of cool stuff happening. You can find out more about it on the KCL blog or on Serpentine's website. Now, all of this research led us to develop a strong inter interest in machine learning backends and interfaces guided by our efforts to sidestep the metaphor of automation. We believe that artistic work at art institutions can be central to allow for a different understanding of AI. And we don't like the AI metaphor that automatically, that, that replaces the human with the automation, as you will see. Um, we are inspired by Joanna Zielinska's last book, AI Art Machines, where she uh, asked uh, or denounces, can computers be creative as a misguided question? Because she says, we shouldn't pitch the human against the machine. Um, art has always been technical and thus also to some extent artificial intelligent. Next slide. So another um, yeah, writer we want to mention and we worked with um, is Christian Anderson and Søren Polt. Um, they wrote a book in 2018, The Meter Interface, and they situate the interface as follows. The interface, and this is a quote, exists between user and computer, but it exists at other levels too, between different programs and even between hardware and components. And we will see that this is very much the case for artificial intelligence when artists are using it. Um, so our current, oh, sorry, no, Mercedes. Sure. <laughs> So our current endeavors separate the front end from the back end of art making, and I'll talk about that in the next slide, in order to study the approaches that artists use during the R&D of their work, the research and development of their work. And we're particularly interested in the various interfaces artists traverse when tinkering or experimenting with ML. So what we mean here, and we should qualify this as slightly different from how developers or programmers consider the back end and front end. Um, so what we are stipulating is that where the interesting stuff is happening, where the interface layer um, that we are interested in and the site of, in our sort of hypothesis of real art, of the sort of conceptual art making when it comes to machine learning is happening in that back end space. So things like data identification and collection, cleaning, labeling, and preparing data, identifying the models and scripts you will employ, like whether those are open source or not, and building a working environment that allows the practitioner to interact with the model and data in a meaningful way. And uh, we'll talk through some of those working environments in, in some case studies. The next phase is testing in this sort of iterative way and uh, adjusting that working environment or certain parameters. And it's in that feedback loop that we're really interested in. The front end is, of course, when projects are shown in an exhibition or in a presentation, um, but often that back end gets lost at that point. And the, um, the interesting thing about artists working with machine learning is that there's also this alternate output, which often includes building or developing software and publishing research, sharing research, either through academic journals or like kind of open source spaces. So visiting the backend interfaces in the projects we're going to talk about today, which are four, we also like to ask how machine learning is transforming the making of meaning. And this goes back to a discussion um, we started in around 2019, um, has been published in Culture Theory and Critique. Elaine mentioned it early. And we test the thesis today as well, that programs informed by machine learning are able to perform a new task, which is the encoding and decoding of language and images through the calculation of meaning. And this word calculation of meaning, where some people really don't like it because they think humans create meaning and not machines, but we are inspired by Stuart Hall, who wrote about encoding and decoding with a link to television programs. Here you can see his diagram. We really like diagrams. And um, we are testing and trying to see if we can shift this diagram and the way he addresses it around. And this is still a work in progress. So the question we will ask uh, in this sort of case studies we will present is how is the materiality of machine learning entangled in the making of meaning? 
And can contemporary artworks experimenting with machine learning systems help the public, so us, to understand those systems better? So our current research explores this question by looking at artistic approaches of various artists, uh, among them uh, Rafiq Anadol, Adam Harvey, Wiley Shi, and Alison Parrish, with whom we've had uh, studio visits, virtual studio visits, and conducted interviews. So I'll start with Rafiq Anadol. Anadol experiments with materializing and dramatizing data through immersive environments and moving sculpture. In our interview, uh, Anadol explained that his projects are realized by a large team, including two experts programming data and machine learning with him. Anadol's research capabilities and experiments are housed on a separate studio website and sit outside of his front end works shown on his own personal website. Anadol works closely with key players in the field of AI, such as NVIDIA, and he stands out as someone who's built in-house capabilities and can access often very expensive computational power and graphics processing power, and also the newest, sometimes unreleased tech um, entrusted to his studio for experimentation, which is also sort of a new model. So these unseen tools of the studio are really interesting to us, such as the latent space visualizer, as they call it, um, which he showed us in our studio visit. It's built to navigate the data of his projects, and it's built on top of this sort of TISNY network, which is used to visualize and understand high dimensional data sets in 2D. And it creates clusters or neighbor groups around certain images or image traits and allows one to move visually through a data universe. And often we don't necessarily know what it is you're, what you're, what you will encounter. And it, it, for Rafiq, helps him understand what the GAN is actually practically doing. Um, so here's a short video of um, the kind of two screens next to each other. One is the latent space visualizer. And on the right, you can see as it's trying to map the image that might occur between two data points. Um, he's also built another tool shown below, a graphic interface that allows him to manipulate every single layer of the neural network. And he can manipulate decisions and watch those live. The TISNY or latent space visualizer is something that he also uses in his final outcome at the front end. Um, for example, in latent beings from 2019 at LAS, the viewer gets actually located in the latent space visualizer and like the model would is the one navigating between those 10,000 photographs of Berlin in this case. So to summarize, uh, Rafiq takes backend tools and he uses them to understand the data and reinvents ML mechanisms such as this in his actual artwork. The artwork's created in close collaboration with technical experts, although he's also a programmer, and research in Anadol's case is a spin off. So he develops his own category for it. So I move on to the next case study, which is Adam Harvey and his project V-Frame. Uh, Adam Harvey is a researcher, engineer, and artist focused on computer vision, privacy, and surveillance. So next slide, yeah, here it is. So uh, some of you might be familiar with him. He became quite known uh, with his work about surveillance, such as CV Dazzle, which my students always love very much. It's a camouflage from computer vision or from a specific facial recognition algorithm that has recently been turned into the project Megapixel, where he's investigating the origins of face recognition image data sets. So if you type in exposing AI, you can test if your image has been used to train facial recognition. The most recent project is VFrame. VFrame is, uh, uh, uses digital documentation of human rights violations, for example, in Syria. So there is now in the time of GoPro and iPhones, there's lots of material, video material from Syria. 
Um, but this material cannot be sort of seen, so to speak, because it's too, there are too many videos, too many hours. So in cooperation with the NGO Mnemonic, Harvey is trying to build tools to analyze the video footage and especially the ammunition and weapons appearing in the video footage to show human rights violations. So the challenge he sees that we, the situation brings with it, machine vision can only see data. It has plenty of examples to learn from. We all know that. If there's no data, there's no vision. Ammunition and weapons are in parts um, uh, objects that form which of which there are not many labeled images. You can't download a data set of labeled rockets and so on, so on. So VFrame is a project that is creating data and data sets through labeling video footage, but also by creating 3D um, yeah, objects. And you can see here, EFA uh, labeling an object in the interface Adam Harvey is using to label this. Which needs to be precise, otherwise the machine is confused. <laughs> There you go. And that's done, I think. Um, when um, talking to us, we made some notes. They have not been corrected by Adam yet, so any mistakes on us. Uh, but he said a lot of the work in developing a neural network model is that you often don't know if it will work until it works. You just go and have to try things and learn as you go. Depending on how it works, you go back and fix things. I've heard it described as prompt engineering. You get a prompt of a problem and then you solve that problem. And that occurred in his project quite a lot of times um, with labeling the data sets. How do you um, yeah, label it? And um, what is when an object is half obscured and so on, so on. Um, what I really liked is that in when we spoke to him, Harvey also talked about the visual energy of a neural network, and he said um, it falls back to the reality, and he wants to fold it back to the uh, reality in order to intervene. Um, so to create with AI, you have to create data. And he said it does matter what the algorithms can do. Artists have a role in shaping and sculpting the data. So in VFrame, Harvey allows machine learning systems to see by creating data. And what we found really interesting is that this is a project that really turns the normal creative process on its head. Normally, artists create through AI. But in this case, there is creation for AI, allowing machine vision to function. The project is conceptually exposing how AI systems work at the same time and create meaning and where and how they could fail in society, for example, in areas where there's no data. So in summary, uh, for this case, we came to the conclusion that Harvey focuses on back-end mechanisms of machine learning systems. His work exposes the inner workings of these systems conceptually. In this case, the artist is the engineer working in close co collaboration with other human rights experts or other experts um, to create those uh, machine learning systems. And again, we find research being a core element. So in Harvey's case, even the core outcome, which is helping human rights projects. So that was case number two. <laughs> okay, so case study number three, Wiley Shi, who is an artist and technologist exploring digital media as a means of image generation. And um, we specifically focused on the project Terra Mars because that was where he was first starting to investigate GANs. So she says, Earth shines on Mars through AI's imagination. In Terra Mars or Martian, and Martian Earth, she imagines alternative planets using a new application of Pix to Pix to map the topographic data of Mars onto Earth and vice versa. So Earth data was used in the training phase while Mars data was used in the generation phase. And she says, I realized that again, is just mapping from one domain to another. And he thought, what's the most interesting and most surprising, how about Earth to Mars? And that mainly had to do with this sort of alienation, alien nature of how we think about 
Mars. So he says a successful neural network model is the result of lengthy iteration of architecture, refactoring, data wrangling, hyperparameter tweaking, and model retraining. <laughs> Such a good sentence. Um, so for the artwork, he went through uh, 76 generations. Each of them takes a few hours and up to a few days. Um, and so you can see these sort of sample results demonstrating the training process. And um, his core work was figuring out how to take this very tiled imagery and smooth it. Um, and to do that, he discovered uh, some new research for the process of texture synthesis and batch normalization. So here you see that kind of um, tiled uh, view from the previous slide, and he's slowly working together with the model to figure out how to sort of like weave this fabric together and completely make it smooth. Um, all of these images that I'm showing come from a paper that she published uh, in Leonardo. Again, we're seeing this kind of uh, theme of artists being very transparent in the work and seeing that the way that they're solving these technical problems being integral to the work. So she works with the backends and machine learning systems to create new visualizations directly through Python. In this case, it's his interface. And he also he is also a technologist working within the engineering community. So learning from it, finding these new papers that you know are on batch normalization, and then making his technical steps transparent. Um, we see research being a core element and him returning that knowledge back to the community. Now, our last case is Alison Parrish, and we really wanted to include her uh, because this is about natural language processing. And so far, we have talked about images, and I think uh, it's quite important to bring this other dimension in. Alison is a poet, software engineer, and creative coder who skillfully explores the unusual phenomena that blossom when language and computers meet. And that's more her words than mine, um, so it's quite sweet. Her work compasses you can see on the left here, uh, and you can see they explore a central element of poetry, phonetic similarity, so from north to south, and uh, it slowly uh, makes it, the word makes slowly its way there. How does it do it? She works on the aspect of phonetic similarity by creating a machine learning model that has two parts, a speller, which spells words based on how they sound, and a sounder out, which sounds out words based on how they're spelled. The model then generates new imaginary words, which you can see on the left between uh, Leonardo and Michelangelo, Machelen, Lainalet, Donatello is not a new word, um, it's between Donatello and Raphael, Latinalet, and so on, so on. So it's quite, um, yeah, lovely. <laughs> Um, her artist role is very collaborative. She's also a teacher at NYU Tisch, uh, but she is generally, uh, she has the gesture of using platforms that are key to the open source community. All her work is open source and all the encoding processes are viewable and editable. On the Pinselet GitHub, one of her projects or part of her projects, you can also see that Alison received and accepted an edit to her definition of the calculation of rhyming within the code. So that. Uh, it's quite interesting to show this here. So in summary, you see we're going towards the end. Um, Parrish explores aspects of language through machine learning systems. Uh, the artist is a technologist working with the engineering community collaboratively sharing her work. Her computational research is definitely collaborative, open source and shared in GitHub, and it includes tutorials in this case. Also, she uses computation to research language. So research is again, a quite an important topic. So our research shows that the moment of creation is not being automated. Um, and that machine learning systems do not replace artistic practice. Instead, artistic practice is setting up machine learning systems, choosing and feeding the right data, and it's handling through iterative and uh, iterative testing and playful tinkering. Here we thought we would throw in our <laughs> diagram, which we're testing out right now, um, this idea that artists create through tinkering with the back end thereby exposing as well as advancing the inner workings of those systems rather than necessarily the front end which the art world uh, particularly recognizes as the work itself. 
uh, you can see we try to move away from the uh, machine learning as the new artist. So uh, we move towards the uh, we move away from automation and towards collaboration. So uh, that's why why we stress here, and this is our last slide. Um, that the work happens through adjusting mechanisms of machine learning systems, experimenting with data sets and their calculation. And by this, they address the very same space as computer science communities, but taking different turns along the way. Technical research outcomes accompany the artist exploration with research supporting the artwork, while at the same time becoming its own independent output. So in form of informing tech companies by Anadol, data sets by Harvey, code that Parrish shares or papers as she published. So that was it. We look forward to questions and comments and of course to the next uh, presentation by Zach. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, both of you, for such a kind of informative um, talk and, and a kind of a look at that that whole, you know, the, the model of practice that you have kind of developed there is so interesting. We're going to take questions after uh, we hear Zach um, talk about his own work with forensic architecture. I'm just going to do a quick bio for you, um, Zach, which you sent on earlier. Thank you. So Zach is a software researcher at Forensic Architecture, where he does infrastructure and interfaces that enable the navigation of large spatio -temporal, or temporal data sets from investigations. He previously worked as a data scientist in NYU and Tokyo and studied computer science at the University of Bristol and the U University of Texas, I think. Uh, in Austin with a focus on human computer interaction. In his own practice, he develops tools that use machine learning on some sonic artifacts in order to create instruments for machine mediated expression. I had a look at those today as well, they're great. So we'll hand it over to you, Zach. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, thank you for the wonderful talk, Mercedes and Ava. Let me share my screen here. Uh, okay. Right. Do you see everything? Along with. Yeah. Yeah, we can see everything. Looks good. Uh, okay. Yeah, this is quite media heavy. So uh, do let me know if the audio isn't coming through in the right way, uh, et cetera. And I'll try to fix it, change my Thank audio. You audio settings on, on the fly. Okay. So uh, greetings from abnormally, almost irritatingly sunny London. And thank you for inviting us to present in this webinar series. Uh, so I'm Zach Ioannidis. I'm a creative technologist, software researcher, and all around sort of data person at Forensic Architecture. For those not familiar with our work, we are a multidisciplinary university research group that provides evidence for civil society groups confronting state, corporate, and human rights violations worldwide. We do this by utilizing spatial and media analysis and producing forms of visual evidence, which include but are not limited to studies of smoke and fluid dynamics, animation, building surveys and models, spatial mapping, photo matching, sound analysis, interactive cartographies, and more. Now, this all requires leveraging an ensemble of different skill sets. So our team is composed of theorists, architects, filmmakers, lawyers, scientists, journalists, and developers. Uh, it's certainly one of the most interdisciplinary groups I've personally worked with. Our models of research may seem somewhat unconventional, but when put together, they compose an ecosystem of practices. So what I'm going to do is, in this talk, I will use a couple of different projects in order to illuminate parts of these processes and show how it grounds and uh, composes our research. To start off, let me show you an excerpt from our investigation on the killing of Harith Augustus on the 14th of July 2018 by police in South Shore, Chicago. This summarizes the key aspects of our work quite succinctly. At 5.30 and 24 seconds, Augustus stopped to talk to Quincy Jones. At this moment, Danny Tan drew his gun.
At the same time, Quincy Jones had also drawn his gun. Despite this, no police officers turned their body-worn cameras to event mode. As the other officers approach, we see a sign that says no guns are allowed on the front door of the supermarket. These signs have become commonplace in Chicago since 2013, when the state of Illinois allowed the carrying of concealed weapons. From that time, carrying a gun could no longer be treated as an offense in itself. At 5.30 and 34 seconds, Quincy Jones can be seen talking to Augustus. Augustus seems fully cooperative as he took out his wallet. At the same time, Megan Fleming swiftly approached Augustus from behind, her hand stretching forward as she attempted to grab his hand, missing it. In her statement, Fleming said she attempted to handcuff him. No verbal warning preceded this approach as required by the CPD's directive. Her attempt to apprehend Augustus with the use of physical force was unjustified because Augustus was cooperative and could have been carrying a gun legally. Now, what, what are these aspects that we're looking at? Well, first of all, we operate in conditions of conflict. In, in this case, we're examining police violence in Chicago. Uh, second, we examine events that are documented in different media forms. And so we analyze, map, and model these events in order to expand and unlock information embedded within the frame of an image. Here we cross-reference multiple sources in order to triangulate the precise position of each actor in the scene. You'll see this is a methodology which is used across um, a lot of our investigations. So from the moment that we we make it, we spend a lot of time sort of refining it and recontextualizing for the arenas of other investigations as we see fit. So everything is always a, a, a work in progress for our methodologies. Finally, we prepare a report of our findings in order to expose certain facts in a given forum. Uh, these might be typically art exhibitions, international courts, truth commissions, citizen tribunals, environmental reports, and even ones in the UN General Assembly. Now, let me demonstrate how the use of emergent technologies fits into our models of research by switching focus to a project done in late 2018, which was called Triple Chaser. Forensic Architecture was invited to participate in the 2019 Whitney Biennial in the midst of the controversy of Warren Candor's association with the institution. Candor's, also vice chair of Whitney Museum, is the CEO of the Safari Land Group, one of the world's manufacturers of so-called less lethal munitions. Now, when US border agents fired tear gas and grenades at civilians in November 2018, photographs showed that many of these grenades were manufactured by Safari Land. In the US, the export of military equipment from the country is a matter of public record. However, the sale and export of tear gas is not. It is only when images of tear gas canisters appear online that monitoring organizations and the public can know where they have been sold and who is using them. But this kind of manual research is laborious and time consuming. So Automating any part of that process could be hugely beneficial to human rights monitors and the pursuit of corporate accountability in the global arms trade. Therefore, we created a system that enabled the classification of Safari Land tear gas canisters and their detection amongst thousands of images shared online. In order to do so, we had to construct a digital model of the triple chaser and position it within thousands of photorealistic environments such as ones in which tear gas canisters are deployed and documented. Um, Mr. David Byrne can do a better job than I at explaining this. We took as our test case, the triple chaser tear gas grenade manufactured by Defense Technology, a subsidiary of Safari Land. Computer vision using machine learning begins by training a classifier to recognize objects in images. Bounding boxes and masks tell the classifier where in the image the tear gas grenade exists. This process usually requires a training set of thousands of images. 
but we were only able to identify fewer than 100 images of the triple chaser online. So we set out to create a synthetic training set. We reached out to activists to find and photograph triple chaser grenades. An insurance claim to Justin and Mikkel sent us this video from Tijuana. An artist, Emily Jassir, sent us this from her Bethlehem Art and Research Center, probably the most tear guest artist residency in the world. From these, we created a digital model according to the specifications in the product catalog. We recreated all the permutations of triple chaser branding around the world. And using this model, we generated thousands of images. We set the model against bold pattern backgrounds to ensure that the classifier learns to identify the grenades rather than the common elements of the backgrounds in which they often appear. We used colored masks to tell the classifier where the grenades are in the image. We also placed the model in photorealistic environments. In response to the invitation, we produced this 10 minute movie, an excerpt of which you saw above. Concurrent to this, uh, artists were withdrawing from the biennial and over 100 members of staff signed a letter to ask the museum for an exploration for an explanation and uh, a protest was led by action oriented group decolonize this place. Kanders resigned from the Whitney Board of Trustees and announced that he will divest his company of divisions that sell chemical agents, including tear gas amidst the use of the triple chaser tear gas grenade by police against BLM activists across the US. Uh, so similar to Ava and Mercedes diagrams, um, this is a much, much more minimal one, which conveys a, a somewhat similar story. So we, we had a pipeline that looks something like this, which by itself is pretty simple for anyone looking at it from a data engineering perspective. Um, however, we are also creating systems with affordances that allow us to socialize this work through sharing it with communities and collaborators. And uh, we do this by using an open source ethos. For media retrieval, we created an open source framework named mTriage for our purposes initially. Uh, and what mTriage does is it automatically scrapes various outlets from the internet according to keywords that investigators and researchers give to it. The, this process is further augmented with the help of people who are on the ground and can provide us with raw material, can help with metadata verification of said material, and they can help us develop and maintain our open source software. To us, it's important that we provide the public with access to the means, tools, processes through which we obtain our findings. And for this reason, we open source our 3D models machine learning pipelines and tools for spatial temporal visualizations. Such an example is the uh, investigation of police brutality at the Black Lives Matter protests that swept the US since May 2020. Here we encountered over a thousand crowdsourced incidents of police violence. And together with Bellingcat and a wider community, we, we geolocated and verified this footage. Then we classified incidents according to multiple categories and presented the resulting data in an interactive cartographic platform. What we found empirically and in the data was the violence that entailed continuous breaches of codes of conduct, the dangerous use of so-called less lethal munitions, reckless deployment of toxic chemical agents and persistent disregard for constitutional and humanitarian norms. In the Battle of Vilibysk investigation, we trained a model to detect the existence of Russian tanks inside eastern Ukraine. This was particularly useful as we had thousands of hours of footage we'd retrieved from the internet. To speed up the process, we used machine learning to help us find the most relevant videos. A machine learning classifier analyzes videos frame by frame, 
and returns a probability that each video it analyzes contains what we've trained it to look for, in this case, military vehicles. We notice tanks recurring in the results, so we refined the classifier to focus on them. We developed a user interface to interpret and navigate the results. Sections highlighted in red indicate where the classifier has predicted the presence of a tank. So you'll notice that a system such as this is not foolproof. It's not ready to be completely automated. But uh, we see this as something which is quite necessary, very beneficial in our work. Uh, within the spectrum of uh, fully manual processes and, and total automation, we also uh, see a lot of value uh, in being somewhere in between in the spectrum, uh, sort of having a symbiotic human in the loop interface. Uh, and I think this is consistent with uh, some of the things that were said in, in, in the previous presentation. And this is something that I'm really looking forward to discussing. Moreover, as a process, this is something that can be recontextualized, right? So the models can be trained on different data sets. These platforms can be used by different civil society organizations other than our own with their own different needs. And what's good about this is that by creating common benchmarks and metrics for accuracy, we can leverage specific domain level knowledge of collaborators in order to collectively improve outputs for additional use cases. And so what we see um, and what we're talking about the past few years of forensic architecture is that with the advent, the advent of mobile phones and platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, social media bears collective witness to incidents from multiple angles across the globe. And this is particularly evident in the Gulzar case where our open source investigation in collaboration with Lighthouse Reports and Bellingcat found over 100 videos pertaining to the incident. A large part of our design process is to develop and reform tools often utilized to serve the needs of capital towards a more humanitarian counter forensic endeavor. Yeah, what we mean by this is that we seek in fact to revert the forensics gaze and to investigate the same state agencies such as the police or military that usually monopolize it. Therefore, it is more a counter forensics, that which we do, an interrogation of the interrogators. The investigation is a tool we utilize in the process of collective truth production. It becomes of particular significance at a time when the proliferation and mass dissemination of information and media around us has not by itself delivered on the promise of making us a better informed society or creating a more open and transparent world. Contemporary truth is never solid, but more fluid and solvent than ever before. It is formed, reformed, and deformed in the public sphere as a result of the constant opposition between divergent claims and recognized discourses. With our work, we seek to welcome and engage with the crisis that new media has provoked. In this sense, it is an opportunity to reconstruct progressive democratic and inclusive modes of truth production today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zach. And thanks uh, to Eva and Mercedes as well for such amazing talks. Um, so I think we're probably waiting to have some questions coming in from our audience. Um, so I think Elaine and I have the pleasure, I guess, of, of getting to ask some questions first, but I don't know, Elaine, if you wanted to jump in with anything. Um, there was a few, yeah, I have a few um, questions. One um, is around this idea of open source. I mean, you both mentioned it as kind mm. of a key part of your practice. I mean, how important is it uh, from an ethical perspective or even, a, you know, as a, a core kind of concept within the work that you do is that you make work open source and do you find issues with that? Are people kind of taking that and doing nefarious things with it or are you finding that that the balance in it, you know of kind of giving people the tools to work themselves outweighs any other kind of negative sides of the idea of I, I mean I love open source so I'm just curious that could be for Zach 
I'll yeah. try, sorry, I should have said. I, I, I'm throwing it at all of both of you, though. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think this can yield a very fruitful discussion because as a technologist, I think the way I see it, there are many gradations to uh, open source, right? So for us, it's not only um, the, the, the sort of uh, philosophical choice that we're making in the eyes of journalism and what we're pursuing um, in order to stop disinformation. It is necessary that we have multiple points of views, multiple optics, multiple mediums through which we can examine uh, the source, whatever that is. As a programmer, I think it is born out of a sort of pragmatic need that as a studio, uh, our expertise, our time is, is very limited, right? So out of this context is uh, born the desire to use open source and it's great that it works really good in conjunction with the type of research that we do, which benefits from it. I think there are various stages to open source. I think it would be very difficult for us to sustain a model in which we also have to support everything that we're putting out, but we have gotten a lot of help from different people uh, expanding on our techniques and then uh, giving back the results to us. We are, we're working with different organizations that are basing the research on our tools and by extension, everything that they're doing uh, can also come back upstream to our internal code base. Um, and obviously, as we said, we're kind of looking at ways how we can centralize um, this sort of intelligence that we have of methodologies within the team for external access and collaborations. Yeah, I think even within your practice, even, you know, the the way that you, you, you know, you get testimonies from the ground and they are in a sense open source as well, that you very much at a grassroots level in, employ this idea of open source, I find, uh, very interesting between the technology, the software, the means in which you kind of carry out this uh, method of of gaining information from the ground as well in a very kind of open source way. So I find it fascinating that that you know at its very core, both of your organisations um, kind of employ a very open ended. Uh, notion of knowledge and collective knowledge and how do we move forward with this as artists, designers, thinkers, and um, academics, even in, in trying to, I suppose, address some of the complexities around using this technology. And um, how do you find it within your organization? I mean, I've seen your library, so <laughs> I know that is part of your practice. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the question of open source is, is super interesting when it comes, I, I sort of am separating the idea of data. There, there are certain data and data sets that um, um, are necessary, sorry, the, tr the train might be very loud, that are super necessary to not be visible. So we sometimes uh, prioritize visibility, but of course there are certain um, instances where, um, data sets being extremely visible does more harm. Um, but I would say in terms of the open sourcing of software, what we see being really important is an opening of the idea of who is the artist and the very collective nature of this kind of work. So um, when you start to dig into the kind of various levels of um, engineering that have gone into the production of, a, of the work. And if you actually counted all of that collective labor, you would sort of reorganize your idea of who's the artist in that. And that I think that's part of the impetus to looking in the back end environment. So it's not just the artist whose name is attached to the final artwork, but all of the infrastructure that was built up to create that in the end. Um, so I think that that's really key to like redefining the constellation of who is the artist. Um, and then, oh, I've completely lost my other point. Okay. It's gone, it's gone. <laughs> Yeah, I, just, I, I noticed on your own repository that you have a lot of like people who are making their own, you know, they're not dependent on big tech to mm. 
you know, there's the odd occasion where, you know, um, he, he's looking, using it in NVIDIA, but it's a very specific kind of use. He's not reliant on it. Um, so I think that's very interesting, just kind of pushing outside kind of big yeah. tech. And, and also big tech uses open source you know, software all the time, you know, like Google Col Collabs is built on Jupyter, which is open source. And I think there's a lot, a lot of sort of giving them more credit than they deserve. And it's really those open source communities that um, my personal opinion is that cultural institutions should be doing more to support those um, infrastructures and not relying on tech companies that sort of like build on top of that and end up getting credit for it yeah wow but i think that's such an interesting point yeah. um I, I was i guess i had a quick question i was thinking you know i'm so fascinated by the different kinds of models of practice that you both put forward there for sort of artistic engagement with ai i was thinking about a paper which i think was co-authored along with kate crawford in the summer of 2019 and it's got it riffs on the Benjamin paper. It's called something like The Work of the Artist in the Age of AI. And it's quite an interesting paper because it looks, I suppose, at how artists are working to sort of critique or defamiliarize strategies. I'm sure you're familiar with the paper um, around machine learning and AI. But also, I think, maybe poses the questions of what are the sort of ethical standards that artists themselves should be accountable to when they are working within these spaces, for example, maybe working with sensitive data sets, or also maybe thinking about how particular work is perceived or viewed when it moves across these different spaces. So for example, when it may be a violent image or something, a sensitive image is moved from you know, a judicial context to a gallery context, to a social media feed, to an academic paper, for example. And I wondered, was this something that Either either Zach in your capacity in forensic architecture or Mercedes and Ava in your work, if this was something that kind of is, is being teased out at the moment. And feel free, whichever one of you wants to jump in. Mercedes, please. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's quite um it's quite difficult to really see and I'm sort of I know what you mean but I think I'm also find it quite difficult to while, while in our presentation we try to find specific strands I think it's quite difficult to put the artist automatically in the position of you have to be the ethical consciousness mm. of society mm. and but I mean I guess I just mean the ethical the actual ethical frameworks that artists themselves need to kind of engage with more than them being the ethical watchdog I guess. yeah but, yeah. yeah well I think that that happens through their work I mean in the work of mm. Adam Harvey and forensic architecture that's apparent you know you can't um, get around the fact that this is an issue I know funnily enough that Eva also had the issue when she was uh, producing an artwork of Jena Sutella so they had to they produced an app that would come up with um, Eva you probably are better to explain it actually <laughs> Oh, um, well, essentially, it, it produced lots of problematic sentences. Um, it was, you know, a generative app. I won't go into yeah. the details of it. But we, you know, had to insert the artist in part of the production process of someone who would vet the sentences that came out because the, the point wasn't just to let the AI be offensive. You know, she and her studio became involved in vetting the sentences and trying to understand um, how language can be manipulated in ways that you don't understand. Actually, we worked with Alison Parrish on this and we learned a lot from her. She explained that, you know, you can censor certain words, but when, when a sentence is constructed in a certain way, it might be the words are fine, but the meaning is still very harmful. Um, well, and yeah. so in these, in these projects, you often end up learning, like in this instance, way more about language than you, th you think you're going to. It, it seems like it's a machine learning uh, project, but in fact, the machine learning is the tool to understand language better because you have to be so uh, precise with what you're asking uh, of the model. To a certain extent, the artist is put in the same situation as tech companies when they uh, let their tools wild, you know, you need yeah. to 
understand the situations that come up when you put this tool out there. And that, that means, you know, you on your own are not enough to really think all those situations mm. through. So you need a diverse friend, lots of friends, collaborators, yeah. colleagues that help you to think through it because what one person, what comes to mind in a white person is different in a non-white person and so on, so on logically. So it's quite, quite important. Mm. I, I think in our case and in, in the work that we do to address a point that was raised earlier and one that I see in the comments as well, um, in an ideal case, it should be that the work that we do and the work that Adam Harvey does is um, so well put together, so well documented, so as to remove the burden of us having to be the arbiter of ethics of the thing that which we're presenting, right? So. We can act as a curator of a particular narrative um, from footage on the ground. But when we're talking about open source investigations, open source journalism, I think we understand that every singular data point that we see can be flawed, can be doctored, et cetera, et cetera. So it always, it's always our approach that nothing singular is true unless it is corroborated by many different angles. Um, and I think that is the, the, the one case, one sort of idea that we can use for cross verification of, of the things that we're seeing. On the other hand, the work that we're doing, I would say is not generative in the case of generative artists like uh, Alison Parrish, for example, we don't give people uh, an infrastructure, an ecosystem or a framework that they can generate and you don't really know as an artist, you don't have control over what's coming out. Uh, of course, that's always the case because the data that's being fed into the model is always curated by humans, biased in its own, own ways, et cetera. And some of my favorite pro projects with regards to AI are the ones that sort of subvert uh, the idea of objectivity of the model itself. Um, what we were doing in our case, I think sort of having a human in the loop process. We know that no algorithm is infallible. We know that no human is infallible either, but maybe by working together, at least we speed up the process and we have a layer of redundancy on top of the investigations that we're doing. And it seems like with the practices both of you are pointing to, there's no, you know, that sort of human in the loop aspect, I guess, is the, is very much kind of put to the fore as opposed to something that you're kind of pretending, as you say, is, is completely objective. I think there's a question in the chat maybe that kind of dovetails nicely with what we're discussing, which is from Claire Redelman. She doesn't say who it's addressed to, but she's saying that she's interested in what the speakers see as the politics animating their work. In particular, is art being instrumentalized and or used as alibi for more and more documentary production? That is, should art not be able to function differently than documentary methods to be less tied to instrumental outcomes? Is that for? It doesn't um, say. But... Yeah, we can say something, Zach, while you, it's for you, while you put <laughs> 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 it's, it's a bit of a difficult question. But yeah. I can, I can say, I mean, one thing that um, became quite apparent and that is sort of linked to this documentation question mm -hmm. is that research is becoming more and more important in contemporary art and not necessarily the other, you know, it's not necessarily instrumentalized automatically. Mm. It's just put out there and then can be used again by different people in different ways. Now, um, some of the artists like Adam Harvey are, you know, not explicitly being a strong artist in the same sense as uh, Rafik Anadol would call himself artist. There are different models out there. And I think we should be so open to also allow different models of art. You know, we don't have to pin art down and say, art cannot be an instrument. It always must be uh, non-instrumentalized, therefore forensic architecture is not art or something. I think we are way beyond that we need these definitions. Um, I think the way of these documentary processes are functioning um, is quite new and it's an exploration of the technology. And I think what is for me, I mean, uh, same with Adam Harvey as with the forensic architecture project, what these projects make quite apparent is that 
we live in a world where only machine vision is only there when there's data. Now, um, you know, those human rights violations are excellent fields where this becomes really clear. But this is these are examples that are not just instrumental for human rights violations. You could think that for every single uh, societal group that has no data representation. And uh, that one technique that is an example there for human rights violations can then be used in other areas where that are maybe less drastic, but are still then lead to underrepresentation. So in that sense, I'd say we shouldn't be so um, strict about it. Also, I know Claire what you mean because I'm working with Claire. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. <laughs> on, on, on my behalf, I, I would say that personally, I have a very soft spot for this sort of non-operative type of art, the uh, subversive situationist type of meandering art that I love seeing with latent spaces. I love seeing people uh, create instruments, new modes of expression using these kind of things and sort of um, understanding what the parameter space of all this data is and maybe uh, introspect what is the actual like humanity if there is something behind uh, the output itself. From a, a, a sort of utilitarian perspective of our work, I think we operate across many different contexts and we have, um, we have an exhibition opening at the Hakeve in on the 3rd of July. Uh, it's also tied with a film that Laura Poitras is showing, uh, which is coming out on the 18th of June, if I'm not mistaken. So as I said, we have a sort of multi-model uh, output, but the art form and the art context is um, serves a very important function when we want to build some sort of social pressure for the messages that we're showing. Um, and because the means of... Uh, knowledge of uh, sort of news is very centralized, it provides us with a different avenue through which we can present a message and find uh, stepping inside of these contexts. So I, I think, yeah, two different types of art um, and the art forums I think should be able to cater to both. Yeah, I, I do think that art has is in a unique position in society when it's not tied to any kind of necessarily any political affiliation and it has that ability to step outside, you know, let's say the politics of a, of a, of a government or the politics even of our own country and be able to state things that or see things in a different way that perhaps politics can see or that an economist can see or other professions We'll see it maybe perhaps in different ways and I think art allows a more uh, I suppose a different perspective on a situation and that's why I think I don't necessarily see a difference between something that's documentary or art it to me there's a language there that that translates across all all, all of those mediums mm -hmm. so um we have a few more questions I'm just aware of the time yeah um, we have uh, Mia Lee, and this is for Mercedes and Eva, and it's kind of a dual question, if you don't mind. So I'd love to hear your opinion on tools like One Way ML, which is which aim is to make machine learning more accessible for artists and creators. And part two of that is how important it, is it for creators to know or, or understand the systems they're using, basically. So that's for you guys, the um, for Mercedes and. Um, Eva. Do you want Should to I go? Yeah. <laughs> um, I would, so we obviously have the Runway ML linked on our database. It was important for us to think of all the different entry level points into working with machine learning. Our position is that, you know, when people are afraid of working with machine learning, they turn to these sort of obvious ideas of like, it's bad. I don't get it. I'm, you know, and the, the dis for us, it's like, we're trying to reduce the distance people have. So if at, a, at an entry level point, there's an easy interface or easy interface that helps you start to explore and see that, oh, I see how it's making mistakes. Maybe this is how I can start to understand these systems. I think that's absolutely fine. I mean, I was just speaking to some um, 
computer scientists about how the idea that there is like very approachable AI that you can just teach yourself very quickly is kind of a misconception. It's really, I mean, these tools are really hard to use and it's really hard for a single artist to just decide they're going to, you know, make something with TensorFlow. Um, and that's why, again, we were, we're really always addressing the idea of like larger communities of people who teach each other or who work together. And so if Runway ML is one way into that, then I, I, we think that that's great. In my personal opinion, it's crucial to understand what the system that you're working with is doing. I mean, that's the work that we're interested in um, Can I ask yeah. a little follow-up question there? Um, just, I was so, a question that's always going to my head, not just in your presentation, but every time I, you know, engage with an artist who's engaged in this kind of work is like, is it necessary to have high technical literacy to do this? And maybe just as an aside, I actually asked that question to Winnie Soon recently, you know, who's another kind of artist who's very much engaged in this sort of space. Mm -hmm. And she had, you know, she was sort of saying, um, you know, and then even if we understand the code, does that mean we understand what's going on? Because, you know, you could understand English and not understand political rhetoric. And I guess I wonder, uh, there seems to be quite a big burden on artists in this space then that you have to be an artist, but also be, as you say, like, no tentative flow, become really, really technically literate. And it might feel a little bit maybe overwhelming. Maybe are there other ways of engaging with this or is it about collaboration? Uh, with other experts. yeah I think I mean we can see, we see many different models we see also mm -hmm. models of artists who work together with technology producers and just as if I said you know tinkering with ML runaway is also quite good it's just you need to be open about it and you need to ask questions and uh, and have a technologist friend or uh, or ask someone to check before you go public if you're not making a mistake but you know we we have if we publish a text we have copy editors it's not very different and i think the most important is that the more people start to understand really how machine le logic machine learning logic works instead of how the code really works mm -hmm. and it's it, not everyone needs to label their own data um, that's not the case, you know, these are very specific projects, but to understand how this the dynamic and how the logic of this machine vision or machine writing and machine spelling and understanding how this works, that's more important, I think, um, because we also know, uh, to be br brutally honest, that, you know, for a lot of women don't have the feeling, oh, the tech world's mine, I can, you know, just march up and go and start create. So that would exclude them automatically. And I think every step towards working more with machine learning, uh, this world needs it because this is the technology that will fuel most of our information systems in a few years. So yeah, get your hands on it in any way you can. Yeah. Um, I'd like to just add, add, ask a question in regard. Oh no, sorry, Zach, go ahead, you answer. I'm happy to. I, I, I was just gonna say that for me, what I find is the most important personally is uh, the the concept and the critical thinking around generating the concept itself um it was like runway etc are amazing for people wanting to experiment and getting their hands dirty for for the first time um but i don't know how much interesting or different work novel work can come out of these things only by playing with these systems and i think maybe it can work in the beginning of a, a particular sort of revolution, a new algorithm comes out and you have a lot of people tinkering and having visual outputs, et cetera, et cetera. And this is something that, uh, you know, generative uh, uh, neural networks are really good at doing. So we see a lot of artifacts that uh, come out, resemble um, each other. But I always find it interesting when there's a concept behind that, even if it's sort of retro rationalized, then that's what makes the difference to me. Um, and it's a very complex field. I mean, for computer science history, it's relatively an old one. There's been a lot of iterations, but also we're standing on a moving tower of abstractions. It's impossible to go all the way down that stack. So you always have to be thinking about what level of abstraction you're comfortable with working. And it's good to have collaborators that work and think across different level of abstractions. It's also good to have people coming in from completely different disciplines because they can give you an insight that you as a person working in that domain would have never thought about. So to me, it's also about the ideas that come 
and are engendered from working inside a, a sort of transdisciplinary environment. Um, and that leads me on to a question for, for Ava, uh, and that is in, in around this kind of production of knowledge and um, the kind of idea that, uh, you know, in order to experiment in R&D, um, for artists beginning to engage in this practice, yes, uh, probably Zach, I agree with you, but I also agree that um, there needs to be a, a level of experimentation and within that there's knowledge production as well, that, it, that you can't just dismiss that particular playing. It's the beginning of something for me and I think it's very important. But I suppose for Ava, I'm wondering in regards to kind of curatorial practices, you know, this is not, a, this is, this is a long game we're playing here with this technology. It's definitely not something that we can kind of go at it for two weeks and go, yeah, I know everything about it. You know, do you think it should be built into curatorial practice now that R&D and experimentation should be part of that in order to kind of push along and, and encourage artists to kind of feel okay in this space and, and possibly have the software or the hardware to work in this field? Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, part of the impetus of the creative, uh, sorry, of the R&D platform um, is, is to work on this kind of specialization. And I think we're moving towards these very sort of, if, if the art world indeed can like grow into this creative R&D space, then we also need cur curators who really understand synthetic biology and machine learning and all of these different um, topics. I think the model that we have of this sort of like globalized art world where you dip into topics and it's a lot about connecting things maybe won't be sufficient. Um, we really need to understand the topics and that's part of what we do with, with Mercedes at the Creative AI Lab. We're really thinking about what are the capabilities that curators need to have and how could an institution like Serpentine help upskill curators so we actually have a PhD um, student working with us on this topic. To, to start to prepare curators, because I, I, I know that um, I was reading an article by uh, James uh, Bridal, he was talking about, you know, the, the problem with an institutional critique of something like ML is that they don't necessarily understand the technology. And it's not, it's not that it's, it's just so new as well, like the, the, the critical thinking around it. So how do you critique work? Mm -hmm. of AI if you don't understand how it's made. Yeah, I guess the, the thing we were saying about artists producing their own work, it applies to institutions as well. So not always outsourcing the work, but building some of that skill set in-house and building production teams that include curators so that they have to run up against those issues of, I don't know, labeling data or deciding on a model or deciding the politics and ethical position within that if they're going to open source it or not, those are the kinds of things that um, should be within the institution. That knowledge shouldn't be constantly outsourced and drained from the institution itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, we also I, live in quite an interesting time. I mean, on the one hand, people are quite worried about artificial intelligence becoming more and more important, but um, the homework that we need to do is how does it actually work? involves really sitting down and moving through and um, a lot of people at the same time don't want to do that work. Um, so yeah. there's sort of this dilemma there with technology, which is I'm, a, I'm the same. I want my computer to function, but every time it doesn't function, I learn something new about it. So um, yeah, I think, I think generally, uh, yeah, go on, Ellie. Yeah, no, it's one of those topics that when you start talking to people, they're okay for five minutes and then they start going glazing over and going, I just, I'm just going to press, you know, uh, I'll accept all cookies. I really can't, you know, so there is that kind of frustration with technology with people kind of overwhelmed. And it's quite, uh, you talk about the black box system quite a lot, this opaqueness within. And I think part of the work that interests me, what you're doing is about revealing the back end in order to kind of go, listen, there's no magic here. Mm -hmm. there's yeah. no kind of there's hard work there's people um, and there's the thought going into this so I think that's yeah, I think really art, art spaces and artists can be really an, an, a super great I mean the public needs them you know uh, if we wouldn't have them the future would look quite bleak because I mean I also do analysis how artificial intelligence is negotiated in newspapers 
and it's horrible. <laughs> It is basically very like, uh, oh yeah, the artist will be your doctor, uh, the, A the AI will be your doctor, or the AI will become the new lawyer, and it's sort of a very simplistic uh, report that people are fed. And we need places where there's the will to a bit more complexity, and I think art spaces are really badly needed. Yeah, and I think, um, Zach, you, you operate out of a, a more institutional kind of uh, setting and that but you, you've crossed over into the art world which you know like what do you see from your perspective um around what is needed for to support artists in this field you know to cross over and to develop as you said deep or meaningful work with this technology are you talking about the creative ai field or the art and ai yeah i'm talking about in general you know artists who want to begin to work with this field and sort of that the, you know the support structures that that we were talking with ava about you know the kind of the the gallery and the institutions kind of taking some of that on in order to support artists yeah um what i found interesting from my experience at the uk university is that it's sort of the discipline of computer science felt a bit walled off with regards to other disciplines. And I know, I know this is not probably only a problem here, but in the US universities sort of have a different structure where uh, you're actually forced to meander a little bit and dip your toes into different disciplines. And I, found, I find that very valuable also for developing a sort of mm -hmm. um, ethical um, ideas around technology. The fact that you, you have to think about these things and they come together. Uh, and when you start working with AI, especially being an engineer, it's it's extremely hard to focus on the problem itself and it takes over you and you're only thinking about how to solve this problem. And then eventually you're losing context of what is it that, uh, who am I solving this problem for and uh, how can my work be used? So I think that's something that especially uh, can be dangerous in really big organizations and uh, big tech corporations where uh, you're sort of isolated, you and the algorithm, and you're tweaking parameters on a model without really having a holistic idea of what the work, how is that being used. So I guess in my field, then I guess I ended up in the art world by accident. So I don't feel like a native resident of that yet. But I feel like in the work we're doing, we're always kind of asking that question, or if I'm not asking the question, I know there are people around me that will force me to ask that question and not lose idea of the wider context. So um, I don't know, I, I find that architects also have a different mentality with regards to um, tech people. I, I kind of feel like they, they, they see knowledge in a different way, like different modular uh, pockets of ideas that they can just plug into their practice and it works in a very mix, mix and match way. So um, yeah, additional exposure definitely helps. Um, being able to decipher and understand that AI is and should not be a, a sort of black box. I think humans feel very comfortable um, leaving things as abstractions and because of that, and we see that in the investigations that we're doing, uh, it's very easy for people to control the narrative or a top-down sort of state uh, news, et cetera, how they're talking about algorithms. So yeah, I guess, I don't know, it, it's a bit of both. It's, it's the work of the uh, organization. Uh, it's their job to be extroverted and it's also the work of the individual, I think, to keep that in mind that have a social conscience of the work that they're doing. If there are institutional ways of doing that, I think definitely they should be pursued. I, I just wanted to make a, a small aside there when you were talking about the black box, I guess, Elaine and our speakers and the work that you're doing to uncover that. But what I found also really interesting, I guess, about your practices was, you know, the idea of the sort of human in the loop as well you know um, I'm actually reading a really interesting book at the moment by Mary Gray who I met a couple of years ago in Microsoft research um, but she's you know one of a number of researchers I suppose who's exploring um, 
how we need to sort of think about the kind of the very the human labor I guess that's involved in in these sorts of so-called as you said automated systems and but funny Elaine just asked I suppose Zach you know what like what you know what kind of does he feel like he needs in terms of resources and sort of the very last question that I had as well jotted down was like what do we still need and I guess I wanted to put that question to to Ava and to Mercedes like in terms of you know blue sky thinking what do you feel like your institution still needs? Is it more funding? Is it a different kind of a pedagogical model? I don't know. Um, I wondered if you had any thoughts. I can ask for, uh, from Zach's perspective, I would say um, institutions need more EFAS. <laughs> Because <laughs> like, you know you need more people that are really sort of informed and understand uh, the technical process, but also I have the other foot deep in the art world. Yeah, and, and this is something where I think some art institutions need to decide if they want to go into this field. They need these people in the institution, not mm -hmm. you know not outside the institution. And it's mm -hmm. the same probably. I mean, you both work within now the gallery, so. I think asking these questions running this series is quite important. So I would say that. And before we, um, just very quickly, I wanted to answer Victoria B's question about the image data gather yeah. via password capture for <laughs> websites. What are they used for? Well, you're training Google. It's a Google project. Google has bought it from Carnegie Mellon and you're training Google's AI by understanding which tiles have an object. And I think we had a few questions, but they, I really feel they were possibly kind of answered by Zach because we have a couple of questions around kind of truth claims in relation to these sorts of open source intelligence projects. But actually, Zach kind of managed you sort of pull them all together in your very your first answer. So didn't kind of come back to those. Yeah. Um, and what about you, Zach? Uh, blue skies um, anything uh -huh. your hearts desire? <laughs> money, money helps. For sure, I, I think. That's very honest. <laughs> how can how can we make it uh, attractive? I think, yeah. What Mercedes said, people like Eva. I think, what happens in the art world, I I see it a little bit as a sort of, organicity, um, or organic community formation, right? Where, you, have people organically sort of reaching out each, to each other based on uh, common interests, et cetera. So I kind of see FA and other art practices being in London for the past few years, based on the work that they do and the things that they're, they're interested in, they will always find and connect with the right people. Um, and I think that's one of the, the, the things about physical coexistence. I, I don't know if we're ever going to have a sort of physical coexistence and uh, art schools kind of forming on the basis of spatiality alone um, in our time and age. But I see these connections forming organically, and I'm just wondering whether on the institutional level there could be a way where we could accelerate them. I mean, um, I think that would be the biggest priority. How, we, how can we create some sort of... Um, forced, unforced cross-pollination of different disciplines and people having different discussions in the same spaces and getting people to go out and create things together um, based on things that they're interested about. So that, that would be my, um, I think, answer to the question. And that would also have to include people that are um, completely outside of the art world because, um, no offense, but sometimes I think it can be a little bit incestuous, especially in in big cities. Um, so yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I, I do think uh, that, uh, you know, like a proper, you know, the, the art world in certain cultures, even in Ireland, you know, doesn't represent everybody within society. And I think that that, you know, and especially when it comes to technology, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't cross over age very well you know so there's lots of kind of gaps within society that aren't being kind of reached necessarily by using kind of technology so um i think it's there's lots of work to be done but we are looking at your model uh, i'm finding it fast both your models are, are so fascinating in regards to what it is you're trying to achieve and also just a, a sort of a some kind of beacon for us you know to look at and say it is possible and these are you know these are kind of tests that we have done and tried and 
this is working, this hasn't worked. So those conversations, I think for people who are beginning to address this and countries who are trying to start conversations around this or artists who are trying to work in it. Um, I think these are vital that we can look to models and say, these are successful and they can work and we can, we can use these or these are the resources that we have we'll share with you these kind of things all like they're you know knowledge for me is built on the back of trend really already we just add to it then hopefully you know so thank you very much i really yeah. enjoyed elaine our chat. elaine yeah. i'm wondering now i'm completely putting it on the spot but i'm just thinking this is like our last uh event in our whole digital culture series and I guess you were just speaking there about um I was curious you know what do you feel have you learned or was there any new insights that sort of I don't know that you had from from sort of running yeah I think this for, for, for me this session yeah. was vital this was mm. my key session for the whole thing was yes we can talk about this but how do we do it how can we go about mm. setting up structures supports for artists to access this in Ireland. And I think that's key. You know, I see yeah. lots of artists working on their own and it's such an incredibly difficult field. It is mm. so, like it, it's overwhelmingly terrifying, you know, either tech, technically, but also the hardware, you know, even the directions you need to go. And then put on top of that, the critical thinking around this technology. It, that to me, I think this whole series has begun to shape this, and I mean, within our, within an Irish context, but looking at kind of really good models of practice for me was, is key to moving yeah. forward. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's, and what about you? I guess um, two things I was kind of blown away by, there seems to actually be a real hunger from the kind of general public and, ge you know, just a general audience of interested people for these kinds of discussions where we've sort of been curating maybe these events in various guises maybe they felt a little bit more niche in the past and actually now there seems to be a kind of a, mm -hmm. you know, there's an understanding that this isn't just kind of a sort of a technical concern, but it's very much a social concern. And then I guess, yeah, just being exposed to so many different sorts of models of pedagogy, of artistic practice, uh, of critical thinking. Um, it's really kind of expanded, I guess, my, my understandings of the kinds of methods that, that are in play. Yeah, and just that so you can see, like for, for, for everybody we've talked to, there is a human, such a human element, despite the fact that we're talking about an insanely difficult and complex technology to deal with, to work with, to think about. But the human side has always been really paramount. And mm -hmm. I think that's just the people who, who who understand that. And I think the art world understands that to a large degree. There has to be a human side. So thank you all. Um, it was wonderful um, chatting to you tonight and thank you for your imparting of knowledge. I would love to, at a later stage, you know, obviously use your tools, <laughs> but have a chat with you guys. And I know because Ireland, yeah, because artists, it's quite young here in Ireland, the kind of use. There are artists kind of doing it, but it's tiny little pockets. So um, uh, we will be looking at, what, you know, kind of with, a strong eye of what you're doing and how you're developing your work and I'm also looking forward to seeing the paper that's you know it's kind of an infrastructure <laughs> or a blueprint is it the paper that you're developing Eva we are working on it <laughs> yeah it sounds really interesting like it's like I'm not sure exactly what it is that you're going to what's going to come out but I'm so excited to no, read we're it we're going to share it yeah good good yeah. is it a blueprint or is it <laughs> kind of uh, it's going to be for uh, for the Hong Kong conference for AI art machines. Okay. That's happening at the moment. So um, it's going to come out of there. There's okay. also the, the um, a series of reports called Future Art Ecosystems that the R&D platform produce. And those are Great. downloadable PDFs. One is out already and the next one comes out um, in ex exactly a month. Wow, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so that addresses more of the questions you had about um, support structures. Yeah. And, and actually, Zach's point too about kind of foregoing the sp spatial uh, closeness and in favor of like building communities around certain topics and things mm. like that. Yeah. But thank Great. you so much. This was amazing. And thank you to Zach. I really enjoyed your presentation. It was amazing, Zach. Um, I just, yeah. yeah, just in awe of all your work, actually, <laughs> to be honest. We are very, I feel we're, we're 
we're babies. Okay, you hosted the brilliant series. We are in awe of your series. Yes, totally. <laughs> Fantastic. Please um, use away. I mean, it's free. It's there as a repository online. Thank you to yeah. Anne for that. Yes, just want to say a big thanks for organizing Anne. that. And also just thanks to um, NCAD, to uh, the Digital Hub as well for their support, their financial support, but also their kind of, yeah, do it, you know, just start start this conversation. Mm. So, um, and thank you guys. Thanks, Rachel. I think that we're, thank we're yeah. Thanks for having us. So Thank you. Bye, everyone.